So what if I told you there is a cyber risk present today in cellular communications that allows an attacker the ability to send you a phone call and your device is uh, compromised? That's it. There's no user interaction. There's no clicking any links. There's no picking up the phone. Just the simple fact of or the simple uh, ability for the phone call to be sent. And this threat vector, which is present in cellular communications today, provides an attacker the ability to deliver a no-click remote code execution exploit over the air, under the radar, to your device. And to be more accurate, any device that's even momentarily connected to an attacker-controlled cellular tower. So today we're super excited to be here. I appreciate everyone joining. Uh, we want to talk to you about our review of the Pixel 6 modem stack. Uh, it's been a culmination of uh, many months of our efforts. Uh, I'm Farzan Karimi. I'm the engineering manager of the Android Red team. I'm joined by our world-class researchers here, Shuan Ching, our technical lead, Eugene Rodinov, and uh, Shiling Gong. All right, so here's our session agenda. We'll provide a brief overview of the Pixel 6 modem stack uh, and share the results of our impactful 2021 uh, Red Team engagement of the modem. 2021, yes, that's how long it took us to get PR approval if we get up here. Um, before jumping into what we were able to exploit, uh, we'll set a bit of context and cover a high-level architecture of the Pixel modem, uh, followed by our key findings. Uh, we'll then cover two CVEs that if you Google, you'll see nothing about them on the internet today, aside from the fact that they're rated critical severity by NIST and our Android severity guidelines. Uh, these two CVEs that we identified were integral in our exploit chain. Right, so we're going to deep dive those. We're going to show you a demo that's pretty, pretty exciting. Um, and then moving on, uh, actually, we also want to cover a very important step you can take uh, from a remediation standpoint that better protect yourself. So it's probably the most important takeaway from this presentation. So stay tuned for that. I do want to emphasize before moving that, uh, on that everything we're going to present uh, today is fixed. Um, no zero days, I'm sorry. So just a uh, um, really high level, uh, actually, I'm sorry. Yep. I uh, just wanted to give you like a basic understanding of the engagement missions that we had for this review. Uh, the primary objective for our review was to get code execution on the Pixel 6 modem stack uh, via the baseband uh, and then work with our feature teams to fix all these bugs before release. Uh, we did a pretty good job on that. Uh, there was a critical issue that came up that uh, put this talk into jeopardy that Eugene would uh, we'll cover in a bit. And then bonus points uh, for working with our modem OEM to fix everything before release. As with most uh, DEF CON presentations, uh, we did achieve these uh, objectives. So a little bit about us. We are, as I mentioned, we're the Android Red team. We work for Google. Uh, our mission is to increase Android uh, security. So that means we Red team uh, devices that run on Android. Uh, it could be Google Pixel. It could be Pixel Watch. A uh, whole ecosystem of devices. Uh, we do that a number of ways through offensive research, where we simulate adversarial campaigns. Uh, we build tools so that help us uh, scale. So we invest a lot in fuzzing, and primarily uh, continuous fuzzing to help us scale and find bugs while we're doing more manual uh, uh, code reviews and exploit development. That's the third item, exploit dev. It's a place we spend a lot of time in. Uh, a lot of people ask, like, why do you spend weeks on exploit dev? And for us, it's so important to be able to better articulate these complex issues to leadership with a demo. Um, it also uh, allows us to find more vulnerabilities as we go through the exploit writing exercise. So it's a really uh, fruitful investment for us. And then finally, uh, we invest a lot in remediation. We work with our feature teams to fix bugs. If nobody's fixing our bugs, we suck as a red team. And so we want to make sure we build a good relationship there. And uh, so that's something we, we really value. So let's get right into it. Why do we pick the modem? Uh, for starters, it's been an emerging area of risk in the mobile connectivity space uh, for a few years now. Uh, you can see some of the headlines. Uh, these are all very recent. Some very recent work by Project Zero earlier this year on the modem. Uh, why all this attention now? So the short answer is the cost to ride uh, has dramatically decreased in the past few years. So if you're looking to get yourself equipment, such as a software divine radio or an SDR, uh, 10 years ago, that would have put you back ten dollars to $20,000. Today, you can get an SDR for two k So it becomes more accessible for security researchers and uh, real hackers to, to go purchase this equipment and target uh, cellular comms. 
Uh, it's also one reason we're, we're seeing more of a recent influx of bugs coming in through our bug bounty program and uh, why we're able to get a bunch of SDRs for our team to find a bunch of bugs. So what can you do if you actually find a bug in the modem? Uh, so some uh, earlier I mentioned over the air RCE. If you're not familiar with that terminology, over the air is simply just a form of digital communication, uh, usually in the form of a software update that's sent uh, wirelessly like over the air to your phone, uh, sometimes through Wi-Fi networks. Most of the time it's um, associated with cellular communications. In the pixel modem stack, getting over the air RCE uh, nets you code execution in a privileged context. That's because there's no concept of identity isolation or uh, network segmentation within the component, the modem itself. And so you get code execution, what, is, what can you do? Right, so one thing you can do is denial of service. I, I could already see eyes glazing when I say DOS, but in the context of modem, it's actually pretty impactful. So just imagine like a football stadium filled with tens of thousands of people, all connected to a single attacker controlled cellular uh, tower and then everyone losing connectivity all at once. If you're more of a nation state profile, you have more interesting uh, exploit vectors at your disposal. Uh, you may be interested in pulling SMS text data or RCS text data uh, and just uh, passively sniff that information, right? Uh, you could also spoof messages coming from users that you target. And all this allows you to do uh, something else. So you could target OTP code sent over SMS to get yourself a MFA bypass. All right, so we all know like there's forgot your uh, password opportunities to just like uh, get a code sent to your text for your phone and then you can log in. Uh, wink, wink, that is our demo later today. So we'll be covering. Uh, what can be worse than all that? Well, how about I pivot to the kernel? So with full root kernel privilege access, you have the ability to fully own the phone. All bets are off. So before getting into our finding as an exploit work, a little background on the modem is always helpful. Wait, who snuck this slide in? It's a 56K modem. It's not what we're talking about. It's very clever. There's zero laughs there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. This is better than Black Hat, thanks. <laughs> Moving on. Let's talk about Pixel modem. What even is it? Well, it provides you a means to connect to a cellular network uh, so you can check text, surf the web, get phone calls. It's a critical component with access to sensitive user data, like SMS data, uh, remotely accessible with radio technologies, and it's a high-profile target for nation state. And Project Zero, if you look, listen to the offensive con talk from earlier this year, uh, it's been a historical source of vulnerabilities because it's using legacy protocols. Uh, and these all present opportunities for security improvement. Uh, it's also super important to note that you know, while we're all on 4G and 5G today, uh, it still supports the 2G standard. Right? And that's an important theme that we're going to get into in this uh, presentation. So just a quick visual of uh, the, our attack surface analysis of the modem. So we're go everything you see in blue here uh, just kind of represents the different layers and the components of the modem, uh, all the way from the communication layer down to the physical layer. Stuff in red is what we targeted during our red team engagement. Uh, dark red is what we were actually able to exploit. So specifically the uh, pre-authentication attack surface in 2G, uh, as well as some low-level decoders such as ASAN1. Um, if you see AKA, that just basically means uh, authentication and key agreement, uh, which is just a common protocol in cellular uh, uh, communications to support mutual auth between a device and a carrier. Uh, before I hand it off to Schwan, I want to get ahead of a question that maybe some of you are already asking, and it's, well, I'm on a current generation Pixel or iPhone, and I'm connected to 5G right now. I'm safe, right? But why does your presentation matter to me? Well, there's a lot of ways you can find yourself forced back on 2G, right? So uh, just listing a couple here, some of these factors, and it's important to note that there's a lot of complex logic that goes into how each of these factors are weighted, right? It's not straightforward. Uh, but if you think of things like network coverage, depending on the country or region you're in, uh, 2G may be your only option, right? So if you're there, you're on 2G if you want to make a phone call. Emergency calls often over 2G to if, when others aren't available, now, other standards like 4G and 5G. There's signal strength, network congestion, uh, battery optimization. So 2G uses less battery than 4G. So if you're low battery, that might be a factor that influences you to switch over to 2G. 
these individual factors actually don't matter too much. The intent of this slide is to just show that a motivated adversary will find the right combination of these ingredients to influence your phone to switch back to 2G. And it's in 2G that our attack uh, lives and thrives. So with that, I'll hand it over to Schwan, who will cover our methodologies. Thank you for that. OK, uh, before we talk about our result, let's talk about our uh, approaches. So um, for our engagement, uh, we conducted uh, mostly with fuzzy as our, our primary approach. The reason that we want fuzzy is that uh, we were given a really large code base, and it's very complex. And fuzzy has been proven very effective and long lasting uh, for this uh, kind of situations. For fuzzy, we, mo uh, we mostly focus on something we call host-based fuzzy. Here, host is a term that coming from Android build system. It's in comparison to device. Host-based fuzzy means that uh, we found our target, we compile it into a fuzzer that can run on Linux host environment. And to do that, we need to carefully um, hack the build system and mock the hardware dependencies so that we can build our target and run it on a Linux environment without physical devices attached. We also looked into uh, emulations of full systems that allows us to do more uh, closer to the actual hardware attacks. And lastly, um, we plan on do on device fuzzing at the beginning, but uh, we are running out of time, so that was cut. Fuzzing is our primary approach. In addition to fuzzing, we also use static analysis. Here we use code QL as our primary tool for something like exploring the code base or doing variant analysis. And lastly, manual code review is always our um, last uh, resort to apply on the areas identified by uh, the above two approaches, all the areas hard to cover by those two, two approaches. So um, by the end of the engagement, we created 10 fuzzers, um, host-based fuzzers, um, running on our internal uh, fuzzing platform 24-7. This is benefit that you get from fuzzing, is that you get something running all the time after the engagement. And it's very useful to catch regressions on new bugs at long runs. We also um, developed a very easy to use um, uh, framework kind of thing so that we can easily convert any new modern component right, that we think is uh, suspicious into a host based fuzzers in, in future engagement. And during this engagement, we found fuzzers not only a great finding bugs, they also tell you which area you should look into. By the number of crashes you found, you can jump into the area. One thing we noticed that it, fuzzing, fuzzers sometimes are blocked by the minor issues like null point dereference and one byte OOB read. Those can get fixed, but to fix things in production code takes time. So our solution is, while it's getting fixed, let's just jump into the code, start manual code review, auditing the related code, so that we can speed up, uh, speed up our bug finding process and find as many as bugs by the end of the engagement. Another challenge we run into is uh, with large code base, how can we prioritize our component for fuzzing? We were giving a code base something around two gigabytes with source code and libraries. And how can we find out which one is the first target? It's impossible to look through in the source code. What we did is let's study the three GPP spec, understand which component is dealing with untrusted data, or which uh, component is dealing with decoders. Like, for example, here, ASM decoder, it's always a, hard, a hot topic. So that's our first target. And another thing, like uh, the TLV data structures that commonly used in the 3 gpp spec, those are all the good targets for our fuzzing. And in addition, we use code QL as our static analysis tools. Modem not only has large code space, uh, code size, but also has very complex configurations. These configurations involve compiler um, macros and redefinitions of some symbols. It's not easy to pinpoint which, which function you are looking at. And code QL helps a lot in this thing. It gives us the exact function that used for the task entry point or interrupt handlers. It also visualizes the interactions between different components. The other way we use code QL is to do general bug findings. We use that to find certain patterns, like mem copy that writes to a fixed size buffer but use a non-constant uh, size parameter. It doesn't necessarily to be an issue, but it, there's issues coming from that kind of usages. 
and, and also fathers find bugs. We use QQLs to try to do variant analysis for those bugs, trying to see if we can find similar bugs. Uh, lastly, by the end of the engagement, uh, we noticed there's a publication research paper called Formwater, which is doing emulation-based fuzzing. Inspired by that, we also create our own uh, full stack emulation using using core-based uh, approach. Uh, with the hardware layers added, we can drop in the former binary and emulate part of the functions, which is great for root, uh, root cause analysis and debugging of our crashes. Uh, by the way, here's how it looks like when we run our emulation-based fuzzer and what happens when we throw in the crash test input that we discovered from the host-based fuzzer. It gives us more information on the memory layout and lots of details that we couldn't have from the host-based fuzzer. From here, I'll hand over to Eugene to talk about the findings. Uh, thank you, Sean. Uh, before we go into uh, details of the vulnerabilities which we identified during fuzzing and uh, code review, uh, I'd like to bring your attention to your really great research uh, presented earlier this year, the offensive con by Google Project Zero. Uh, how to hack Shannon baseband from a phone, uh, which focuses on a different attack surface that we investigated in our work. Uh, they were hacking modem from a phone while we are hacking modem from a malicious base station. So this is an important distinction here. Uh, at the same time, they mentioned that they were looking at 2G and SN.1 attack surface, and uh, they mentioned that they didn't find anything interesting there, like maybe all the bugs are gone. Uh, Honestly, when our engagement team saw this presentation, we felt very relieved and very rewarded uh, for the statement, which means, uh, which might mean that we are, uh, our bug hunting work, which took one year earlier, was actually useful and meaningful. Uh, we're not going to take all the credit for that. There has been other great research contributing to security in this area, uh, but with the next slide, I would like to introduce some additional context. Uh, in this, um, during this engagement, which spanned about three to, more, to four months, um, in total we identified about 120 vulnerabilities in uh, 2G and SN1 surface, uh, and about, uh, about, about 50 vulnerabilities are specifically in SN1 decoders. And as you can see, that the vast majority of these bugs were got by fuzzers, like about 80% of the vulnerabilities were reported by fuzzers. Um, and uh, we were mostly relying on uh, stack traces to dedupe the vulnerabilities. So there is a chance that there is the same root cause, but it manifests itself in different uh, uh, crashes, so they got different box assignments. Um, those fuzzers are running even today uh, on our continuous fuzzing infrastructure. Uh, fun fact, uh, shortly after submitting to Black Hat and DEF CON, one of the fuzzers identified uh, a critical issue, and we were even, about, we were even thinking about withdrawing from uh, the conferences because we didn't want to release zero days and uh, and there is no way PR and legal would would clear this presentation to be here. But well, here we go. Uh, the issue was fixed and uh, we're speaking about it. Uh, by critical vulnerabilities, uh, we mean uh, mostly out of bounds memory writes which are reachable remotely. Obviously, not all the criticals are exploitable because we got quite a few off by one writes, uh, which are very difficult to leverage to get code execution on modem in a remote context. Yet, we got uh, quite a few powerful primitives. So, one of them, which we shall be discussing later, uh, the core primitive for demonstrating code execution on modem is CV2017.0. This is a, a, an out of bronze write in heap. Uh, there is another vulnerability uh, which would made exploitation super easy and straightforward. Well, not super easy, definitely not super easy, but uh, we didn't need to rely on uh, rope style attacks. Uh, is a MMU's misconfiguration which rendered uh, heap and stack at executable. So we simply run in a shell code from, from the heap work just fine. And uh, with that, uh, let's, uh, let's take a look at the vulnerability as uh, 2017.0. This is a linear out of bounds write in heap. Uh, this is a, a classic, straightforward uh, out of bounds write in heap. Um, you can see on the code snippet here. OK, yeah. So we have uh, one byte buffer allocated at this point. So, and uh, this buffer is passed to ASN decode information element function, which decodes. Uh, arbitrary number fully attacker controlled bytes into it. 
Uh, due to technical constraints, we are able to overwrite only up to 255 bytes on the heap, but which is still a lot. And uh, this vulnerability uh, is triggered uh, during the call setup stage. So before receiving the call and even before showing notification to a user that uh, someone is calling them, there is a number of ASN1 uh, messages sent from the base station to the modem. And exploitation happens, uh, well, the vulnerability is triggered at this stage, so there is no user interaction involved at all. User doesn't need to pick up the phone. Um, so this is a very powerful primitive by itself. Right now we'll show you how we leverage it to get uh, arbitrary write primitive. Uh, but before doing this, a few words about heap management because it, it is important to understand how we are um, getting arbitrary write. So every uh, buffer allocated on the heap is prefixed with a 32-byte header, which contains metadata for the allocation, such as how many bytes were requested, what is their task ID, um, allocating memory, and uh, a very important information stored in the very beginning, the first two bytes, uh, is the identifier of the allocation driver. So it appears there is multiple allocation drivers used by malloc. Um, and one of them is a partitioned memory driver, which corresponds to 0400, highlighted here in red. Um, essentially, it manages, a, uh, it allocates memory from array of fixed size memory blocks, which, are, which grow with the power of two. The state of the uh, uh, memory blocks is kept in the additional bitmap and their and uh, looking at this partition memory driver, we didn't find anything uh, what we can do with this um, to, to, to overwrite something useful. However, looking around, we identified there is another allocation driver, system dynamic memory driver, which has ID 0100. And uh, luckily for us, but unluckily for uh, modem, uh, they're using on double linked lists with uh, um, with unsafe unlinking, and uh, this double linked list uh, is also in the heap heater, which we're able to overwrite. So this is pretty straightforward, classical unsafe unlinking technique to get arbitrary write. Uh, in our case, uh, the uh, uh, in our case, the adjacent object, uh, which is follows the vulnerable buffer, is uh, very reliably allocated during the vulnerability. Uh, exploitation stage. So I think in 90% of cases, well, maybe even closer to 99, there is always another object following right after the vulnerable buffer. So as you can see on this image, uh, the uh, address starts at 3A0 is actually the, uh, the vulnerable buffer, which corresponds to the one byte buffer. And uh, at the address 3C0 is the header of the next adjacent object. So we simply overwrite it, we change the allocation driver ID to 0100, we forge the double linked list, and, um, and luckily for us, uh, and again, luckily for modem, uh, this buffer is very reliably freed after the overwrite operation. So uh, we almost have a very reliable arbitrary write primitive, and we use this um, primitive to hook free function. Uh, the implementation of the free function in this modem is quite generic. It's just a stub which calls a real implementation using function pointer, which is stored in global variables. So we simply override this uh, global pointer, and this is how we hook the function. Just to summarize everything together, how, how is the getting RC in modem looks like? Before the overflow, we have buffer A and buffer B. Buffer B has a partition memory driver uh, allocation uh, driver ID. We overwrite it and change to system dynamic allocator. We forge the double linked lists. Uh, so we modify pre uh, field to point to a malicious system header, uh, which is located in the global uh, data, which is readable, writable, and executable, thanks to the MMU misconfiguration. And uh, this this is also part of the stage zero payload, which contains shell code. And once this buffer is freed, um, during unsafe unlinking, we modify the free function pointer, uh, redirect it to our shell code, and here is how it works. Uh, there is one unclear piece here, well, at, le at least one for me, is uh, how did you get stage zero payload here? Uh, this is what I'm going to be here, um, discussing here. So 
before triggering the vulnerability, we need to send the uh, stage zero shellcode. Um, and uh, we identify the primitive for doing this, which allows us to send from the malicious base station uh, to the victim device up to 80 bytes, and we know where exactly those 80 bytes are stored because we need to know the, virt well, the, the virtual address at which uh, this malicious zero uh, shellcode is located. There is no SLR, so this address is fixed. Uh, once we have it, uh, we trigger a CV2017 uh, O to hook free function, and at this point, we're uh, invoking our stage zero shellcode. At every free operation, it is very convenient because we're able to inspect contents of the free buffer, and the heap is used very frequently in many cases in modems, or uh, we can intercept and inspect for a lot of data. Uh, 80 bytes is actually not a lot to implement anything meaningful um, for stage zero shellcode because it's not only shellcode, it's also our, um, uh, the malicious system dynamic uh, heap heater. And uh, what stage zero shellcode is doing is just functionality to your receive uh, stage one shellcode, which is also sent in chunks, 80 bytes per iteration. Uh, later, Shilling will show you a demo, and uh, you, you can see that how we're sending uh, uh, stage one shellcode there. Stage zero shellcode assembles uh, stage one shellcode all together, copies it into your uh, executable heap, and uh, rehooks free function. And at this point, we can implement arbitrary complexity functionality in stage one shellcode. We implemented SMS forwarding functionality, which are uh, forwards SMS messages from the victim device to the attacker control number. And at this point, we are ready for the demo. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so let's go to the remote code execution into modern firmware. Uh, so here is how the attack looks like. The first step, uh, the victim connect to a digital serial network either 3G, 4G, or 5G, it doesn't matter. Uh, the only requirement is that uh, the victim enables 2G on his phone. Uh, but you know, 2G is default enabled on the Pixel 6 uh, and on most of the phones. So now we can set up a malicious base station. It's a 2G base station. We are setting it up and waiting for the victim to connect to it. Uh, you know, there are a lot of purpose and methods about how to get a victim connected to a fake 2G base station. So this is not a problem. Then we can uh, wait for the victim connect to it. And once the victim connected to the 2G base station, we can start our attack. Once the attack succeed, we will have fully controlled the victim's baseband firmware. We are in the victim's modern. So now we can do a lot of funny stuff. Uh, for example, we can use the job or uh, intercept the victim's incoming uh, phone call. Also, we can modify the incoming SMS message or send out SMS message on behalf of the victim. Uh, here, for demo purpose, we will uh, demo, we can capture and transfer all the incoming SMS message to our phone so that we can take over the victim's Twitter account. Uh, here is the device we are using. We are using three devices. On the left is the victim using a Pixel 6, and in the middle is the OpenBTS. We build this fake base station uh, using OpenBTS, and we will modify the source code, inject our malicious uh, package, and do our attack. And on the right is another phone. It's a regular phone. Uh, any phone can uh, make a call works for us. Okay. So let's uh, play the demo. Uh, it's all working. <laughs> uh, l l let me figure out why. Uh, I think uh, we can on. click yeah. it. You're close. Good. Uh, okay. So we are playing the demo. You can see the victim is going to connect to our fake base station. Once the victim connected, we can start our attack. The first step is to send out the initial payload. This is a small piece of code. So we will uh, broadcast this piece of code into the victim's modern firmware memory. 
So now it's inside the uh, victim's model memory, but it's not running. We are getting it running by call the victim. You can see once the victim receives the call, the victim doesn't have to do anything. Our vulnerability will be triggered, and uh, this initial payload will be triggered. So at this moment, we already have a small piece of code running inside the victim's model, but it's just a small piece of code. We want to do more complicated task, so we are sending more code. We send send them piece by piece, and the first stage payload we are receive and assemble them together. Once all the code received, the code, shared code will be running and send out a message back. So you can see now we received a message from the victim and the content is the pond. So this SMS message is sending out from the victim's modern firmware by all shared code. So that means our shared code is running successfully inside the victim's modern and we have fully controlled the victim's modern. Okay, uh, this is the first uh, part of the demo. For the second part, we are going to demo we can take over the victim's Twitter account. To do that, let's put the victim back to a normal base station. So you can see you now the victim uh, connect back to the normal base destination. Uh, that's simply we stop our base station, then the victim will uh, connect back. So the victim can uh, log into Twitter or GitHub or, yeah. Okay, uh, so now the victim open his Twitter account, checking for the new message, and also his uh, profile. You can see he's very handsome, and he has a brilliant uh, profile. And also, anyone know who is the victim? Okay, yeah, I think uh, if you now come to us and get the bonus. Okay, so. If you have a Twitter account but you don't remember the password, you will tell Twitter, oh, I forgot my password. So Twitter will say, okay, give me your phone number, I will send you a SMS message which contains an authentication code. You give us this code back so we can confirm you own this uh, account. So that's how the attack works. You can see we enter the victim's phone number and the victim receives this SMS this message. So, you know, we have a shell code running inside the victim's modem, so this message will be forwarded to us. So you can see we received the same message. So using the code inside this message, uh, we can bypass the authentication from Twitter and get into the victim's Twitter account and research the password. Here you can see the victim can see this uh, message on his phone, but this is just for demo purpose. In a real attack, we can hide this message, make it invisible. So, okay. Uh, now we have bypassed the authentication and um, modified the password. So we are setting it to a very strong password. And I think uh, we're done. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, we have taken over the count. Yeah, so that's the count we have. Yeah, that's the demo of into the remote code execution of modern firmware. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll hand over to Xuan for the next part. Thank you, Xilian. A very impressive video. Focus. Okay, um, just to clarify that in the video you see a lot of operations on the victim's phone, but those are just for them for us to speed up the demo. Uh, in real case, victim doesn't need to do anything. This is a zero click, fully remote uh, attack. To get the attack to happen, there are some prerequisites. First, the victim's device needs to have 2G stack enabled, which is by default uh, on Pixel 6 and many other modern devices. And also, the victim needs to be in the nearby range for us to deploy the attack. Depending on what hardware you're using, this nearby range can be up to five miles range. Once we launch the attack, we get a full modern firmware compromise. We have full control of the modern firmware. If I have time, I can write a debugger on, uh, for debug modern firmware. And uh, in demo, we just showed how to demonstrate the Twitter account takeover, but the real consequences can be much worse. You can take over somebody's Bitcoin account, 
get all their uh, monies. Or you can even send messages on behalf of them. We also, um, during the engagement, found uh, other bugs that hinting it's possible to pivot in from modern to the Android OS that can lead to full system compromise. However, we ran out of time, so we didn't dig further in that direction. And the issues utilized by this exploit, there are three issues. The first one is the root cause. We have attacker controlled heap overwrite in the GSM stack. And second, we have a misconfiguration in the MMU that allows us to have writable and executable memory. And lastly, the lack of standard security mitigations making our exploit uh, easier. Yeah, before uh, modem engagement, I always thinking hacking modem over the air is a very high tech complex task. It requires very expensive de devices. But our set setup really surprised and scared me. As you can see, it's pretty simple. The core part of this setup is that white box under uh, the phones. This is an SDR device. In our case, we use USR PP200. Um, and then we have a bunch of cables. For legal compliances, we also have Faraday cage so that we don't um, interfere with neighborhood telecommunications. So if you are malicious ha attackers, make sure you have this box so that you don't break the law. You don't want the FCC show. Yeah, it's very important. <laughs> anyway. And for softwares, we have uh, software-based GSM solutions. There are many of them. OpenBTS, ETBTS, they are either uh, free or open source to use, very accessible. This entire setup is very accessible. It's less than a couple thousand dollars, and you can get even cheaper with the cheaper SDR devices. And like other exploitations, we always run into challenges. For this one, the first challenge we run into is uh, when we put everything into the into the uh, Faraday cage, they interfere with each other. And the radio is totally black magic to me, so I have no idea how to solve it correctly. What way do you just manually tweak the positions so that they work? Um, and of course, we also need to mix a couple of softwares working together. They are all complex softwares. We have to carefully tweak the configurations so we can get a reliable uh, exploitation. Because this is exploitation, we do this on production images. And debugging shell code on production image is a pain. Luckily, we were able to collect uh, RAM dump and uh, exact, uh, inspect the memory status when it crashes. We also modify some of the command handlers and to conform the successful uh, deployment of exploitations. Lastly, as Eugene mentioned, our first stage payload needs to fit in 80 bytes space. It's less than 80 bytes because we also need to uh, fit in some um, fake uh, heap um, pr primitives. Um, it's not easy. We have to go through all the ARM uh, instructions set, trying to, uh, trying to see if uh, get, that works. Eventually, we got it to work. So that, there comes the demo. So uh, from here, I'll hand over to Eugene to talk about the remediations. Thank you. Uh, speaking of remediation and hardening work, uh, besides finding vulnerabilities uh, via fuzzing and manual code review, uh, Android security is also uh, trying to reduce attack surface and uh, make exploitation of classes of the vulnerabilities more difficult. And uh, one of the uh, features which was recent, recently shipped with Android 12, which is supported on certain versions of Radio Hell, is ability to or, uh, disallow 2G networks in via your SIM settings. And these mitigations would essentially make you immune to the attacks which we just demonstrated because in this case, uh, the enforcement works at the hardware and the firmware level. And uh, when this toggle is off, the, the modem simply won't uh, scan for 2G networks. In security of 2G, uh, uh, pro uh, protocol stack is a known topic. There are many uh, security features missing, including mutual authentication. And this is one of the reasons why we specifically looked in this attack surface. So uh, you don't need to have uh, the Pixel device to do this. Um, it should be available on the supported versions since Android 12 and supported radio hell version. So if you haven't done this, Android user Android users in this audience, this is what I recommend doing, especially since we are here at DEF CON. And uh, in addition to that, um, 
we're exploring options on enabling compiler-based mitigations for bare metal code in production. Unfortunately, um, state of the compiler-based mitigations for bare metal code is behind of user space code and uh, even kernel uh, for various reasons. Uh, significant resource constraints, missing support from the tool chain. So this is what we are uh, currently exploring and playing with to enable a bound sanitizer, integer sanitizer for the uh, modem uh, firmware uh, running not only on the pre-release test devices, but also to, to be used on production, in, in production. Uh, and uh, with that, I'm passing it to you, Farzan, for concluding thoughts. Thanks, Eugene. All right, thanks, Eugene. Uh, just some uh, final thoughts to wrap up this session. Uh, we, again, red teamed uh, to secure the Pixel modem. Um, we found over 20 criticals and 50 of them in ASAN alone. So a big attack surface, uh, lots of value in focusing in that uh, stack alone. Uh, we invested a lot in fuzzing. That's how we found most of our bugs. Uh, so we continue to do that. Uh, just as Eugene mentioned, 2G is an outdated protocol. Please flip that toggle off if you have an Android phone. Uh, there's been reports and some articles already that there's a couple of fake 2G base stations around DEF CON. If you're in, uh, what was it, Paris and Caesars, probably here by now, too. Uh, this is your friendly reminder to disable 2G. Uh, and if, you're, if you can't find that 2G toggle, uh, you may be on an iPhone. <laughs> On the mitigation side, we're doing more work in this space. There's actually a great article that was released by our connectivity security team uh, two days ago that talks about what you can do more than just disabling 2G or what we've already done. So check out that article. The link's on the bottom right. And it talks about like, doing things like disabling null cipher support on uh, cellular networks. So lots of investment in this space. Our work is never done. I'll just mentioning Red Team's just one thing we do out of many things at Google. Uh, so uh, special thanks to all the, the work streams here and all these teams that participated heavily in our review. We couldn't have found all these bugs without some help. So we, we really appreciate everyone's contributions. Uh, last thing I'll, we'll all leave you with is that this has been a very exciting review for us, uh, but our work isn't done. Uh, we teased a uh, pivot to the kernel earlier. So who knows? Maybe you'll hear more about that at a conference near you soon. Thank you. We have two minutes for Q&A if anybody has any questions. There's a line? OK. There's a line in the center. You could also come up if you don't want to ask your questions out loud. Have we released any of the fuzzing framework for the public? Uh, we, Shwan, do you? Um, I can answer that. Um, unfortunately, the f framework is ready to the source code that uh, <laughs> which is, we cannot release. Yeah. So this is totally internal use. Yes. Yeah, great question. So how much of that 2G toggle that reduces the attack surface we've seen? Um, so most of our attack surface can be eliminated or mitigated by flipping the 2G toggle. But you know, emergency calls use 2G. So you can't fully disable it. We don't disable it by default. That's the reason we don't. So, but you have the option to manually. Yeah, uh, to comment on that. So uh, I think what happens is 2G by default will be disabled if you flip the toggle. But if you are making a 911 calls, that 2G stack will then be enabled just to make sure you get enough coverage. Um, yeah. Yes. The question is, why, can't, why do we still allow 2G? for the most part.
why can't we fix the client protocol in the device drivers? Yep. Can I, uh, let me try to answer this question from my perspective. Um, so um, first, uh, 2G itself um, is by design lack of lots of security issues. So like there's no uh, way to, for the device to know that uh, if they are talking to a legit 2G base station or a malicious one. So this opens a big attack surface that, that we cannot fix it by spec. And second is um, software, by default, there's always bugs. It, it just, nobody can guarantee there's 100% bug-free software. So the way that uh, we mitigate this is to reduce the attack surface. And of course, fixing the bugs is also another perspective. And we are doing that all the time. It's just you cannot guarantee your software is running 100% bug-free. Correct, yeah, the design of 2G doesn't have uh, proper authentications. Any other questions? All right, well, thanks, everyone. Appreciate your time. Oh, there is one more, sorry. So, uh, so the question was like, just by the disable going in airplane mode, th but still using Wi-Fi, disabling Wi-Fi and going on airplane mode, or not going on airplane mode. Okay. Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know if we can comment too much on that. Like, if you could disable airplane or enable airplane mode, disable Wi-Fi, can information still be leaked out? Probably through. Bluetooth, or oh, everything off. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's always, you know. Uh, do you have any thoughts on this one? Um, I um, I don't know how this uh, airplane mode and uh, Wi-Fi disability is implemented. Uh, so uh, my understanding is if you disable them like airplane mode modem should be like shut down and it shouldn't be working at all um, but I heard some brand they have this so when you turn off Wi-Fi the Wi-Fi is actually not completely turned off uh, for some reason which I don't know any details for that and I don't know which device has that but uh, um, modem should be turned off completely if you turn on uh, airplane mode. I think that's by law. You're welcome. Cool. I think we're done on time, right? Cool. Thanks again, guys. Thanks.